in this supplementary video on Dedekind cuts, I'd like to talk a bit more about how you might deal with more complicated numbers using the idea of Dedekind cuts. So what we've been doing in parts 14 and 15 is setting up the canonical or theoretical construction of the real numbers. And we said that the square root of 2, for example, represented as a, a real number, is the set of all rationals that have this property. And now this is a, a case that's repeated again and again in textbooks. This is a sort of standard case for an example of how you can construct a real number using Dedekind cuts. But it should be pointed out that this is an extremely simple case. And in general, square roots are very simple cases to build with Dedekind cuts, since you essentially insert the predicate or the formula there, which reads something like x squared is less than something, less than some rational number. In the case of the square root of 2, it's x squared is less than 2. If you were to construct the square root of uh, 29, it would be x squared is less than 29. And you'd have to add in or x is less than 0. But the situation gets much more complicated with other irrational numbers. For example, how would you think about constructing pi using a Dedekind cut, or e using a Dedekind cut, or even sine of 2? Now realize these are all numbers which for practical purposes are indispensable. We use these numbers all the time, so it's not something we can just sort of uh, ignore even in our theoretical construction. We, we ought to think about how these numbers can be constructed uh, in this uh, theoretical manner. So the big question is for this video is what predicate or formula should be inserted into the dot 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 in each of these examples? What predicate do we plug in there? So in the case of the square root of 2, we plugged in x squared is less than 2, or x is less than 0. But what predicate do we plug into these other cases? What I think we need to do in terms of thinking about this problem is reflect upon what we mean by these more complex numbers. When we learn about uh, computations in high school, or even before, we learn to just plug in these numbers into a calculator or a computer, and the thing just spits out a number. So we oftentimes don't reflect upon where these numbers are coming from in terms of what their historical motivation is, or even how the computer actually knows how to compute these numbers. So let's take the case of e. Now, as you, you'll know if you've taken a calculus course, e to the x has this Maclaurin series, is given by this infinite series, where it's x to the i over i factorial where i ranges from 0 to infinity. And if you plug in the special case where x is equal to 0, you get this nice expression, where it's 1 plus 1, so that's going to be 2, plus 1 over 2 factorial, or 1 half, plus 1 over 3 factorial, or 1 sixth, and so on. 1 over 4 factorial, plus 1 over 5 factorial, and so on. And this series converges quite nicely to e. And when we take successive approximations, that is, we take 2 first, and then we add on 1 half, then we add on 1 6, add on 1 24th, and so on, building our way up to e. Graphically, this is what we observe. So here is the 1 first, coming from 1 over 0 factorial. Then we have the additional 1 coming from 1 over 1 factorial. Then we build our way up to e. And as you hopefully know, e is approximately 2.5. 71828. So this looks pretty good here. Even after four iterations, it looks like it starts to level off here. And this series converges quite nicely to E. Uh, furthermore, this is what we call a monotonically increasing series. The word monotonically meaning that it always increases. So every time I take another approximation, I add on some more stuff. I always add on a positive number of something. So I'm always increasing in terms of the sum. I'm never decreasing. It's always increasing. So what we need now is some procedure or some predicate here for determining whether any arbitrary rational number, let's call it p, is going to be in this set. So I need to give you the formula for determining whether some rational number is going to be in this set. For example, if I were to program a computer, I need to give it the instructions for knowing whether to place it in this set or to exclude it from this set. So as I said, 
this sequence of partial sums is monotically increasing. So what that means is that if I pick any one of these points, I know that the value that the series seems to be going toward is going to be above that example that I pick. So if I were wondering whether that value should be placed in the cut, the answer would be yes, because there comes a point where the sequence exceeds that value, which means that I should be placing it inside the Dedekind cut. So basically that observation, that there comes a point at which the sequence of partial sums exceeds the test value, the, the, the rational number that I'm interested in, gives rise to the following definition. Let's suppose we define E as all of the rational numbers such that there's some other natural number N such that the partial sum up to that point exceeds the test value X. For example, if I were wondering whether, let's say, 1.6 should be included in this cut E, the answer would be yes, because that value, and actually all the values after that, will exceed the test value 1.6. That is, I can name this value n, namely 1, such that the partial sums exceed the test value of 1.6. And the same procedure would apply to, let's say, 2.6. Can I name that value n such that the partial sums exceed the test value? So for 2.6, graphically it looks like n should be 3. So 3 iterations is the point at which the series exceeds, the partial sums exceeds 2.6. And I propose we use that as a criterion by which we judge whether a rational number is in the cut E. And what's left to verify is that sticking in this formula here, there exists an n that's a natural number such that x is less than the partial sum up to n produces a set which is actually a Dedekind cut. That is, it has those properties of not being all the rational numbers, of having something in it, not being in, that is not being equal to the empty set, being closed downward, and not having a greatest element. Those would be the properties that one would have to verify. And it's actually quite easy to show each one of those. Uh, we know something is in this uh, set, namely zero, because all, we're just adding together a bunch of positive numbers. So zero is certainly going to be included in E. So E is not the empty set. We can easily show that the number three is not in this set. And you can, you can just do that by working with a geometric series, a geometric series which exceeds each one of the values of this series. We can also show that it's closed downward because if I find some test value X, which is in this set, if I pick some other value, let's say y, which is less than x, then this less than relation is just transitive. So if x is less than this and y is less than x, then y is also uh, less than this. So y would also be in this set E. And to show it has the greatest element, that's all you do is you say is, okay, let's go one more term more than the test value. And that value will be in the set. Because remember, this is monotonically increasing, so I can always add some more tiny amount of positive stuff to produce another value, which is in this set. So this is quite easy to verify, that this predicate that I plopped in is actually a Dedekind cut. Now let's continue with that idea of defining a Dedekind cut in terms of there coming a point in a series at which the series exceeds that value, at least for a monotonically increasing series. So now let's work with pi. Let's think about coming up with a good definition for pi as a Dedekind cut. Now pi is going to be slightly more complex, but there is a, an infinite product, which is well known, which is monotonically increasing toward uh, pi. And we're going to use a similar strategy. And that formula is called the Wallace product. It says that pi over 2 is given by this infinite product, which has a, a really nice appearance to it. What it is, is just you start at 2, you do 2 times 2, 
over one times three, the two values that border two, the, the value that's less than two and the, the one value that's greater than two, take the ratio of those. And then the next term in your infinite product is going to be four. You just go up by two, you add two to it. So you get four squared over three times five, the two numbers that border it, and you continue on in this infinite product. And here's a symbolic representation of what's going on here. So aesthetically speaking, this product is quite nice and it actually converges to pi over two. So if you want the formula for pi, you just take this stuff and you multiply by two. Graphically, uh, we can see that the convergence of this series is quite slow, or I should say of this infinite product is quite slow. Uh, that's to say, let's suppose I wanted to get the value of pi between 3.1 and 3.15. Well, that's gonna take about maybe 18 iterations. That is, you have to go out to i equals 18 just to get pi between 3.1 and 3.15. So the convergence is quite slow for the Wallace product, but it does actually get there. And so in defining pi as a Dedekind cut, we're gonna use the same strategy as E. So we're going to say that some test value, some test rational number, let's say three, is going to be included in the Dedekind cut if, there's, if there comes a point in this infinite product at which the product overtakes that value. If I can name the iteration value or that little n such that the infinite product overtakes the test value. So in the case of three, it looks like the product gets larger at, what is this, maybe four or five or so. And so three would be included in the dedicate cut. And same thing for 3.1. So I would find the n value at which the product overtakes 3.1. And here it looks like it's about maybe 13, 14. So 3.1 would be included. Now 3.2 would not be included because there is no value then at which the infinite product overtakes 3.2. So I propose that this will serve as a good definition for the pi dedicate cut. And you should explore that on your own. If you disagree, tell me why. Um, if you have any thoughts on the matter, let me know. Now you very reasonably may ask, what if we don't know of a monotonically increasing infinite series for the number we're trying to define? So to explore that case, let's work with sine of two. Now I picked the sine of something just because the sine has a well-known alternating Maclaurin series dealing with only the odd powers of x. And here's a symbolic representation here. And so we plug in x equals two, and we get the following alternating series, which goes toward, here's a truncation here to four decimal places, 0 0.9093. And graphically, it looks like this. Now we notice here, when we do one iteration, which is going to correspond to two, the approximation would say that sine of two is equal to two. Now that's obviously a bad approximation because we know the sine is limited to values between negative one and one. So sine of two being two is, is a wacky approximation. So we go another term out and it drops way below the value that we, we think it's converging toward. It goes below that as 0.66 repeating. And then we add another iteration that goes above it again and then below it and then above, and it keeps going above and below just because we have this alternating series here. So we can see that it looks like, like it's go going towards something, but it oscillates above and below that something that's going toward. So how are we going to deal with that? So here's that graph again. So our previous definition in terms of a monotonically increasing series, we said that a rational number, a test value, was going to be included if there came a point at which the series will overtake that value. Now I propose that we do something fairly similar, except instead of being able to name that little n, that natural number, such that the partial sum goes above or overtakes that test value, furthermore, there, that little n has to have the condition that all the m's past n will have this condition that the partial sum going out to m, any m greater than n, will overtake the test value. Now the reason we have to add that additional 
qualification is the following. Let's suppose we test 1.1. Should 1.1 be included in, in this set? Now, if we left out that qualification there, we would have to say yes, because I can name that n, which overtakes 1.1, because it'd be up there, up there in two. So we would be forced to say that 1.1 is in this set. But if we add the additional qualification that all the m's past n have to produce a value which overtakes 1.1, we would say no, 1.1 does not have to be included because all the stuff after n equals 1 are actually below 1.1. And notice this will work in the case of, let's say, 0.8. We ask whether is there an n value such that all the m's past n give a partial sum which overtakes x, or in this case, 0.8. And the n value looks like it would be 2, because all of the stuff past n equals 2 will overtake 0.8. Now, in talking about this topic, uh, there are a lot of details that need to be covered, uh, especially in terms of uh, the, the issue of convergence, the issue of whether this thing that I propose actually has partial sums, which form a Cauchy sequence, which basically means that the terms get closer and closer to each other within an arbitrary distance. So it's essential to make sure that the partial sums are actually forming a Cauchy sequence, that they're actually getting closer and closer to one another. But one nice thing about this, if this theoretical definition actually catches out, is that it connects very nicely with our ideas of convergence, or even uh, definitions of limits. Because if you've been exposed to, let's say, the canonical definition of when something converges, you have this pattern of quantifiers here. You say there exists an n such that all the m's after n have some property. Now the property for convergence is that all of the iterations fall within some arbitrary epsilon value. In this case, I just replaced it with this, this partial sum overtaking a test value. So this pattern of quantifiers is actually pretty nice because it connects with other ideas. But whether it's going to theoretically cash out, I can't say as of yet. Just to repeat, this video is very superficial on the topic. There are many, many more things that we would have to talk about to make this completely rigorous. And furthermore, there are many more objects that we use all the time in practical calculations that we want to be real numbers that we haven't talked about. And just to point out, if we want these to be real numbers, we do have a sort of burden to say what these are going to look like from a theoretical point of view. Some examples of these numbers might be the integral from 0 to 1 over this bell curve looking function, e to the negative x squared. Now, that's certainly going to be a real number. In fact, it's going to be irrational. And it's going to involve the error function, if you're familiar with that. But I encourage you to think about how something like this might be defined in terms of a Dedekind cut. Because the claim is all these things, or at least most of them, can be defined in terms of Dedekind cuts. How do we actually show that? Or how do we uh, convince someone of that? Furthermore, how would you define the square root of pi as a Dedekind cut? So I encourage you to think about numbers like this. How would you actually do something like this? Or if you're an engineer, you've probably heard of the J0 function, the, the one of the Bessel functions. So how would you define J0 of, let's say, 1 as a Dedekind cut? So I encourage you to think about these sorts of things. How would you actually give a theoretical, de uh, theoretical description of these numbers? And there are many more details to be worked out from even a computational point of view. For example, how do we know that these things have representations that converge? How do you verify that they, they actually converge to something? And furthermore, are they going to com actually converge to something in a reasonable amount of time? How far do you actually have to go out in the series to verify that the, that the partial sum actually overtakes the value that you're testing. So there are lots more issues that one has to think about, and I certainly encourage you to think about these sorts of things.